Okay, so I'm going to start. So, salam alaikum, everyone. Um, Rehab uh, Mahdi, uh, one of the pediatric trainee in Manchester, and I'm the co founder for the Keep Me Safe project, and I'm the moderator for this session today. So, we're so happy to have you all today here. Um, so, uh, for the first people, they've attended this monthly um, CBD and um, lecture sessions and workshop sessions. We are glad to see you here. Uh, I'm going to talk in a um, for the five minutes um, for about what the Keep Me Safe is, what the project and what we are planning to do. Uh, I just want to tell you, all of you, if you can mute your um, microphones, that would be really helpful, just not to do like any, any disturbance or any um, um, problems with it, with it, with the speaker when they are talking. Um, the other thing that if you have any question, please drop your questions in the chat and we'll be able to answer all your questions by the end of the session. Uh, either you just unmute, ask you to unmute yourself and ask a question or you can put it in the chat. Uh, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much for again for having you today. And uh, we're gonna start talking about what the Keep Me Safe project and what the plan in the future. So I'm gonna share my screen. Just let me know if you share, see my screen. Is my screen clear to everyone? Yeah, it's obvious. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, as you see into the screen, the project is called Keep Me Safe. And we've choose that name to, to reflect that we need to keep every child safe in Sudan. So that, that project is designed by two junior doctors, uh, one myself, one of them, and Dr. Arwa Kamal. She is a pediatric trainee in London. Um, unfortunately, she is working today. She is not able to join us, but um, uh, she's one of the, uh, she's a founder of the project and myself as a co-founder. And this uh, project is sponsored by the PSAPCH. For people they don't know what is PSAPCH is, British Sudanese Association of Pediatric and Child Health in the UK and Ireland. They are um, um, really uh, helpful and they fund uh, the project and the course and the other things I'm gonna talk about later in my presentation. So the aim of this project is to run a course and train uh, the junior staff in the PICU in Sudan. So we've choose three of the biggest PICUs in, in Khartoum, the capital. And we delivered in last July a course, um, a pediatric intensive course talking about including lectures and practical sessions to develop the skills and enable the, the, the junior staff, they are taking care of the sick patient to, to be able to do that. So we've done that and it's a really successful course. The attendees are 90 uh, candidates and all of them, we got a very good, um, excellent actually feedback from them and uh, they, that by the course, by the end of the course, they be able to do the basic things and to know exactly how to deal with the sick patients in uh, critical care settings. Um, our aim to do a virtual a, a refreshment course in uh, by the end of uh, February, and that just to refresh all the things we went through in the course. The other thing we've done back in Sudan to establish a local faculty with our PICU specialist and they are able to do a simulation session every month in that, these hospitals, just to keep all the people that are up to date and refresh their skills and not like making them that lose the skills that they've learned from the, the course. And CBD session, what we are doing the last month, we've done a palliative care and end of life care and it was really successful session. And this is our second workshop session. We're talking about the pain sedation in the PICU. Uh, the aim is to include anyone in Sudan and even in the Middle East who's interested in PICU and pediatric emergency uh, and include all the pediatric trainee and registrars in Sudan in the future and to make it uh, to establish a simulation uh, practice in Sudan, which we are not having at the moment. I'm just going to share with you the, the pictures of the, from the course we've done in Sudan uh, in July I talked earlier. This is Dr. Mohammed, one of the pediatric cardiac intensives in Sudan. Uh, Dr. Hiba, she's working here in Wales and she is APLS instructor. And this is from the ventilation session. Dr. Bahai uh, Faxli, he came from Qatar and he gave a, a very useful talks about uh, ventilation and extubation and the respiratory therapist you can see here, Sadiq. 
this is Dr. Mohammed. He came, uh, he's a pediatric uh, anesthetist um, consultant in, in Manchester and they are doing the advanced airway session. This is myself doing the basic um, airway maneuvers. And this is by the end of the course, we are so happy and smiley about the su successful we've done there. Uh, the last slide I just want to talk about, we do have a WhatsApp group. Um, please feel free. We're gonna put the, the part code and the link. You can come and join us. What are you gonna benefit from this group? Uh, what's a group is to update the, uh, about what the Keep Me Safe Project's uh, future plans, uh, announcement for any activity courses or uh, uh, sessions we are doing. Uh, it will be used, uh, we put the, the re registration for, for any activities, CBD or workshop, uh, useful paper, journals, APLS updates, and what new in, in international conferences and anything is related to the pediatric intensive care and emergency. So this is our website, uh, feel free to take a screenshot and we can put this link in the chat. You can just go in and see what we've done and what's our future plan. We do have like a website in the PSAP CH. This is the link and you can go and uh, feel free to ask any question if you have any question. Thank you so much. I'm gonna just stop sharing my screen and we're gonna start with our first speaker. Uh, let me just share again the slides. So our next speaker, we're gonna be Dr. Amal Hamid. Uh, she's a PICU uh, specialist in Sudan. She graduated from Khartoum University in 2009, and she finished her tra pediatric training in 2014. She got uh, more than uh, five years experience in pediatric intensive care, and she's analyst and um, APLS instructor. And she, she is, her special interest is teaching and stimulation. Welcome Dr. Amal to our session today. And we are so glad to have you today. Okay. Do you see the slides? Yes, you have. Hi, how are you? Thank you, thank you so much. Well, yes, you can start, Dr. Rami. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Amal Hamid. I'm a pediatric specialist in Jafar ibn Auf ICU. Actually, I'm happy to present this uh, session with my colleagues which joined from different parts of the world. Um, and it was an honor to be a member of Kidney Chef team. So we're going to talk today about sedation and analgesia. And my talk will be about current sedation practice in Sudan. Okay, uh, my objective will be talking a little bit about uh, definition, some skills, drugs available in Sudan, current practice in Sudan, and challenges which we are facing in Sudan. Next, we have. Uh, the previous one, please. Let's take a look at this picture. As we see, this child was admitted to certain PICU. He's having a into the in the tracheal intubation. He's having AG tube, uh, vascular axis, hemodialysis catheter, and definitely urinary catheter. He may be having other lines, but his lying is still and he's calm and comfortable. This is what we are talking about, actually. Next. As we know, ICU is a very uh, area of stress and anxiety, and it's a place where children can experience pain, which can delay recovery, and it can indeed some delivery of critical care management. So it's very important to use these sedative and analgesic drugs to complete the care of these children. And as we know, also sedation is important to relieve some some uh, stressful condition can cause release of catecholamine and causes unpreventable hypertension, unpreventable tachycardia, and hyperglycemia. So we use it, and it's a very important tool in ICUs. So we can use non-pharmacological versus pharmacological interventions. 
to be honest here in Sudan, this non-pharmacological intervention is a little bit not used. But worldwide, even in a very busy critical care, they use it in certain and when it's appropriate. So it's a form of just decreasing the lights, uh, take their parents, uh, let them cuddle their children and talk to them and to decrease their stress. Next, please. So, as we know, uh, I guess Dr. Dalia is going to come and talk about definitions and so on. But let's talk uh, simply about what are the indication of sedation, general indication of sedation. It may be post-surgery, it may be due to painful uh, procedure like insertion of central line, number two procedure like just doing an imaging like MRI or CT scan. We can use sedation because of the continuous and ongoing discharge of these lines and drains. It's certainly very important in ventilatory children, which may need it to be tolerating their intracheal intubation and to not let them pull out the lines and drains. And definitely, there is some children are sedated uh, because to, de to decrease their metabolic demands, like patients with traumatic brain injury and very poor cardiac output. So the medical condition itself may necessitate sedation. Next. So there is some general consideration which we are talking about when we are using these sedative drugs. Let's start about what are the goal of this sedation? What is the cause of sedation? Is it for short term procedure like just intubation? Is it for uh, mechanical ventilatory children? Is it for MRI or so on? Second, what is the medical condition and the underlying disease of the patient? It is very important to use which type of sedative drugs that we are going to use. So using a drug in a traumatic brain injury differs from patients with bronchial asthma, differs from patients who are hemodynamically unstable. Then how typically do we want to this effect to be introduced? Is it a very rapid effect? I you need it, say, for intubation? or I needed just to take this child for MRI in a half an hour or one hour. So I have a time to take this sedation. So a duration of this sedation also can be in our consideration. What are the potential side effects and what are the unacceptable side effects in particular setting? This point is very important here in Sudan actually. Why? Because we know these sedative drugs are not a safe drugs. It usually affects the hemodynamic stability of the patient. It may cause respiratory compromise and any drug has certain side effects. So what can judge me here in Sudan is just the availability beside this in my mind. Let me give you an example. You know, one time I had a child who is having an increased ICP. He was admitted because of cerebral edema due to diabetic ketoacidosis. And there was no drug available to sedate him apart from ketamine. And as we know all, this ketamine is partially contraindicated in patients with risk ICP. So the provider should overweight the risk again is a benefit that he may have uh, more side effects to be not sedated. So I use this ketamine and the patient did well and it's sedated and discharged. So, other conditions like uh, how the, the drug is metabolized, is this child is having renal failure, hepatic failure, what is the route of delivery, and also there is a cost consideration, especially here in Sudan. Next. So let's talk a little bit about what is available in Sudan. As we know, these drugs are classified into analgesic only, sedative drugs only or just drugs that cause sedation without analgesia and, and some drugs they can then give this analgesic and sedative effect. So what available in Sudan is this simple analgesia like paracetamol and steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to relieve simple bands from some lines and drains and we have sedation like benzodiazepine, medazolam, diazepam, lorazepam actually is not available here in Sudan we have propofol and we have floral hydrate. 
antihistamine, next please. We have also ketamine, we have uh, morphine and fentanyl, we have clonidine, and the neuromuscular profile in Sudan uh, is also is actually there is some difficulties, uh, especially in PICUs. It's available in OR setting, but in PICU recently we, we require to be available. And now we are dealing with atrectorium, aritonium, and also we have a bancronium. Next, please. So this slide shows some sedative drugs with their mechanism of action. I will not talk thoroughly about it because uh, Dr. Dalia and Dr. Ahmed, they are going to talk about it. But I want you just notice that these, most of these drug actions are affecting the heart rate, the blood pressure, and the respiratory rate. So there is the hemodynamic stability and the respiratory status of the patient is very important to be monitored in the ICU setting, actually. Um, so we should monitor this system. Next, please. Not this alone. We should also monitor the level of sedation of the patients. Actually, here in this slide, we have some scale, which uh, is, a, is an assessment tool of sedation. Uh, usually, sedation can be there from just the patient may be easily arousable, or may be having deep sedation, which is unresponsive to even natural stimuli. So we need to have some sedation skills. It's an international skills, which are available in all ICUs. The, many of them, next please, it's actually RAS scale, uh, it's SPSS scale, it's ASA scale, Comfort scales. I will not talk uh, more, uh, but this slide shows RAS scale. This sedation scale, actually, we are working lately to put it as a paper beside the patient in the ICU to the nurse to be the one who is monitoring the level of sedation. I guess uh, Dr. Ahmed is going to talk about it a little more. But next, please, Rahab. So what is the current practice in Sudan? Actually, we have two preferable available drugs, which are fentanyl and medazolam. Usually we choose between them in, in the first system. And actually, if the fentanyl is available because it is a little bit safe, when starting is fentanyl, one mile per kg per hour, and we upgrade the dose up to five mile per kg per hour, and we can reach the maximum dose, and then we can introduce another set of drugs, which will be medazolam. We started with 0.1 milligram per kg per hour, and titrated to the maximum dose we can use here in Sudan up to 600 mile per kg per hour. So these the, is the two big drugs which we are playing with them. Also we have a ketamine, the third available drug. We can, it can be a superior to these drugs. As I, 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 um, I said earlier, according to the condition of the patient and availability. So we start with certain drugs according to the medical condition of the child, we upgraded the maximum dose, then we add the second type of drug. Step three here, it said that we should con uh, consider transition of morphine to, uh, from fentanyl to morphine or from medazolam to lorazepam because of tachyphylaxis. If we use such drug for more than five days, usually we can have some tachyphylaxis. Actually, this step, it's not usually done in Sudan. What we do is that we can jump to the step four and add an adjuvant agent, like, such as uh, PRN chlor chloral hydrate. Or if I use in the Paris fentanyl and medazolam, so I can give ketamine as interrupted doses. Uh, this, according to the situation of the child, the medical condition of the child, how long he is staying on mechanical ventilator, and so on. And I may need the neuromuscular token also in, in a situation of challenging ventilatory children, children who are moving a lot and they will endanger their life, their lives, and they may injure themselves. Next, please. So what are the complications? Or well, let's say what's the outcome here in Sudan in our small PICUs? Actually, this is not the rule. 
we have children who are goodly sedated and uh, they start from ICU and they get fine in their ventilation and so on. But we are talking about complication to improve our um, practice. What we are facing with is some, there is some patients who are experienced and under sedation and these patients may have a frequent subject situation. I, I sometimes actually face with a person who is, uh, uh, when I, I, I was in the round, I knew that he extubated himself eight times. So he's under sedated. These patients we fa may facing asynchronicity in mechanical ventilation, and which add to their lung injury. Uh, sometimes we lost vascular access, actually, it's, which is a sad story in our PIC because we don't have an expert person to do a central lines. So under sedation here in Sudan is a dilemma. Usually we lose the tubes if uh, it's an empty tube or so on, just to simply pull it out when the nurse is one or two minutes away from the patient. And sometimes the patient is aware of surrounding which causes to him agitation, anxiety, hypertension, tachycardia. Sometimes I come in the early morning round, I see all of the patients are, are having some high blood pressure. And my colleagues, they are starting some antihypertensive drugs. So I discussing with them, uh, could you just increase the sedative drug or could you increase just add some analgesia? I guess this child is in stress and having preventable hypertension. So this is one of the complications which we're facing in ICUs. On the other hand, we have over sedation or over sedative patients which are staying more period in ICU, their delay of extubation occurred, they may have some sepsis or nosocomial infection, and they may end with myopathy in ICU. So why this is occur? Why this complication are a little bit more than other settings? Next, please, Rehab. I guess this is the most important site in our talk. Uh, it's talking about challenges in Sudan. So here in Sudan, we have many challenges. We are lagging experience with dealing with these sensitive drugs, which actually are a dangerous drug. If it's in a hand which are not skilled for or not knowledgeable, it's a risky drug. Second, we, we, we are lagging of local protocols, we're lagging of sedation team. Actually, even we don't have a clinical pharmacist or anesthetist nearby in PICUs. Also, there is absence or busity of PICU senior consultants. There is a turnover, huge turnover of PICU staff. Actually, sometimes we are training staff like nurse and medicals in all varieties of ICU care and we lost them rapidly because they are travel abroad. Okay, there is some problem which are facing actually like wrong interpretation of related sedative drugs withdrawal sign and symptoms or interpretation of some uh, side effects of drugs. The patient is hypotensive, hypotensive is hemodynamic instability and you come and see the patient is in two hypotensive sedative agents. So usually, there is lack of interpretation of these issues. Also, we are facing with wrong dose and difficult calculation of some drugs infusions because of lack of experience. Inavailability of drugs is a very big issue inside hospital, actually. Uh, sometimes you are dealing with the status of elliptic patient, you start in medazolam, it is a patient in a medical ventilator, you're hoping to decrease his seizure, and she said to him, you are going fine. Next day morning, the nurse come and said to you, ah, there is no medalogalam in, in the pharmacy. Just like symbol as that, and the co-patient and the parent, or the poor father, unfortunately, go and um, search all over the, the country, which is a very sad story. So availability or inavailability is one of the big issues in Sudan. Uh, I guess in the pharmacy is, still they have a big role in in in, in uh, available yeah, there's this drug available in Sudan the, especially in in hospital just like Jafar ibn Auf, 
we know Dr. Binov is a tertiary pediatric hospital. It does not contain OR. So these drugs are, are not uh, familiar even to the pharmacist. Sorry, Amal, to interrupt you, uh, you've just got two minutes left. Sorry. Okay, I've already finished the half. Thank you. This is the last slide. So to, to, to summarize, here in Sudan, actually, the, 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 the pediatric in intensive care uh, units are growing. I guess it's just in the, the last one to two years back we started to do this ICU work. Uh, it's very poor areas, uh, we're lacking of uh, staff, and it's closed and open certain times and so on. Uh, so this also affects uh, use of these drugs. This slide, last slide, just the summary to what I said. Thank you. This is all that I have. Thank you so much, Amel, for your nice talk and you shared the, your challenges and, and problems you're facing in Sudan. And hopefully this, the next speakers, they're going to tell you some tips, what you need to do with this limited resources uh, you've been okay. with. But thank you so much. If anyone had any a question for Amal, just please drop the, the question in the chat and Amal and all the speakers, they were going to be ha really happy to answer your question by the end of the session. Okay. I just want to remind our speakers that I'm going to just uh, pop in and say that there is a five minutes left just before your um, start of the talk. So our next uh, speaker is this um, Manate Pascu. She's a, a senior PIC nurse in at uh, Hamad uh, Medical City in Doha. She is here today to share us uh, the experience and uh, in a, a pain assessment recognition from nurse inspector, uh, perspective, uh, perspective. And uh, we are so happy to have here uh, you here, Ms. Pasco. and the floor is yours. Are you able to share your screen? If not, just let me know. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Um, can yes, we see very, very yeah, we've seen really uh, clearly. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Arihab, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be invited to this workshop. My name is Minette again, and I am here to present to you um, the recognition, assessment, and monitoring acute pain in children, a nursing perspective. I have nothing to disclose and I have no conflict of interest. Um, let me start by defining pain. Um, according to the International Association for the Study of Pain, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. According to Margot McCaffrey, pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is existing whenever he or she says it does. Lastly, the American Pain Society in 1996 in instituted the pain as the fifth vital sign and it, and it should be assessed and recorded as often as other vital signs. So when do we do pain assessment? Let us start by understanding pain screening. It is, brief, it is a brief assessment or question determining if the patient has pain. We start by asking, are you in pain or do you have pain? It is also important to know the child's word to describe pain and their attitude towards um, pain. Words can be like wawa, ouchie, and some other words. Then their attitude be, can be like crying, aggressive, then guarding the affected area or others. If the patient is experiencing pain during pain screening, a comprehensive pain assessment shall be performed and documented. So how often do we conduct pain assessment? Depending on hospital policies, pain assessment is done hourly in critical care patients, every two hours in intermediate care patients, every four hours um, in the pediatric floor, if patient is with pain every eight hours, if there is no pain, then also during admissions, if there is a change in medical status, prior to, during, and after a procedure. Okay. Um, 
children who have the ability to communicate can, can self-report pain. Noting the fact that self-reported pain is widely considered the gold standard for pain assessment. Meanwhile, other kids who are unable to communicate verbally can convey their pain through their behavioral and or physiological changes. This can be due to different developmental milestones, ongoing changes in illness equity, need for respiratory support, and medications administered. A child's ability to self-report pain can, can fluctuate throughout their admission. Some, child, some patients can be in between these categories. These are the commonly used pain assessment tools in children according to their age group and population. Um, first, there is this CRIS. CRIS is used for preterm and full-term neonates who are not in continuous monitoring. Um, the premature infant pain profile or the PIPP, these are for preterm and full-term neonates from zero to 28 days old. Um, the revised plaque, um, this is a more specific tool for nonverbal and cognitively impaired children. Then the FACES pain scale or the FACES pain scale revised. These are for um, children five to 12 years old. Then the comfort scale. These are for infants more than 28 days and children who are unable to use the revised FACES pain scale. And this is commonly used also for ventilated patients. And lastly, the numerical rating scale. Um, these are for children more than seven years old and adults. Um, let us learn more about the different pain assessment tools individually. Um, let's start with the Christ pain scale. Um, this tool is a 10 point scale similar to the AFGAR score. It is an acronym of five physiological and behavioral variables um, previously shown to be associated with neonatal pain. C stands for crying, then R requires increased oxygen administration, I increased vital signs, E expression, and S sleeplessness. Um, next is the premature infant profile, pain profile, or the PIPP. Um, it consists of seven indicators, including assessment of gestational age and behavioral state, um, heart rate and oxygen saturation, and the facial actions. Um, PIPP creates a score from 18 to 21, depending on gestational age, with 0 to 6 reflecting no pain, 6 to 12 reflecting mild to moderate pain, and above 12 indicating severe pain. Next is the revised flak. The revised flak or flak as uh, meaning face, legs, activity, cry, consolability is a behavioral pain assessment scale for use with children unable to self-report their level of pain due to um, developmental disabilities. The assessor will rate the child in each of the five measurement categories. Add them together and document the total pain from 0 to 10. Next is the FACES pain scale and FACES pain scale revised. The pain scale is a self-report measure of pain intensity developed for children. It is a picture-based scale where child selects one of six faces to represent their pain experience. Next is the comfort scale. The comfort, the com comfort scale is a valuable and reliable pain assessment tool for use in post-operative post ventilated pediatric patients. It possesses internal consistency and is a reliable pain assessment tool for use in ventilated patients. Lastly, the numerical rating scale or the NRS. It is an 11 point scale scored starting from zero to 10. The patient is asked to assign a number to their pain with zero being no pain and, the wor and 10 the worst pain ever. It is very challenging to assess pain for children who are unable to self-report. Behavioral and or physiological manifestations may also provide cues other than pain. A hierarchy of pain assessment techniques 
has been recommended as a framework to guide assessment approaches and is relevant to patients unable to self-report. Um, first, we need to search for potential reasons for pain, um, review the patient's clinical conditions, are there any problems or diagnosis that commonly cause pain? If so, assume pain is present and treat it. Um, anticipate and treat pain caused by procedures. Rule out other conditions such as constipation or infection. Be sure the patient is dry, warm, or cool enough. Position in a comfortable way and other huh? basic needs are met. Try to obtain also, second is try to obtain self-report. Attempts should be first made to obtain self-report from all patients, even if it's a simple yes or no. Um, it may be possible if to obtain a self-report from patients with intellectual disabilities and those who are critically ill. Third is observe behaviors. Be vigilant for subtle behavioral changes. Remember that behavioral changes do not translate to a pain intensity rating, but should raise suspicion of the presence of pain. Fourth, um, ask others who know the child well, parent or the caregiver. Um, ask others if the child is in pain. Those who know the patient can best help us identify specific behaviors that indicate pain for the patient. Then lastly, trial a treatment. Um, pain, if pain is likely, attempt an analgesia. Um, look for changes. Then after that, look for changes in behaviors and other signs of improvement. Um, whenever pain is identified, a comprehensive pain assessment should be done. Assessment should include location. This can be single or mul multiple sites. Intensi intensity using the appropriate pain assessment tool. Then duration for how long the pain was. Frequency, how frequent did it did it occur? The characters such as throbbing, aching pain, dull, sharp. Then if patient is sedated, so just indicate the sedation score. Then document also the vital signs and intervention. Then lastly, evaluate. It is important to complete the pain air cycle. What is pain air cycle? So pain air cycle is a nursing sensitive quality measure that ensures successful pain management. It emphasizes that after performing a comprehensive pain assessment intervention, whether pharmacological or non-pharmacological, must be done immediately. Then later, a reassessment will be performed to evaluate the effectiveness of the intervention. If the intervention was not effective, the plan will be modified by the team and until the patient's pain is well controlled and managed. So the nursing pain management utilizes the three piece approach. This includes pharmacological strategies and non-pharmacological interventions. So first is the pharmacological st strategy. Uh, I think this will be further discussed by Dr. Adalia. This is an inter a dependent nursing intervention. Second is the physical strategies, um, which includes position of comfort, examples are deep breathing exercise, touch. Then lastly, the psychological strategies. Um, this can be like um, prayer, meditation, providing age-appropriate toys, um, providing distractions. Finally, um, pain reassessment. After an intervention, pain should be re-evaluated. Re-evaluation varies per hospital policy. For intravenous, intravenous pain medications, um, it's usually being re-evaluated after 30 minutes of ad administrations, while oral medications and non-pharmacological interventions, these are re-evaluated after one hour of administration or intervention. These are my references and thank you. I'm Dr. Rehab, I'm done with my presentation. Perfect, thank you so much for your really lovely talk. And you talk about very important thing, the last thing you've mentioned about, we need to reassess, whenever we've done any intervention, we need to reassess. 
and thinking about de-escalation, uh, any kind of sedation or pain for the patient, because we don't need to give unnecessary drugs uh, and we need to reevaluate what after any intervention we've done. Thank you so much. If you have any question for me, just please put it uh, in the chat. And by the end of the session, we're gonna address all the uh, questions. Okay. So our next thank speaker, uh, thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dalia Abdurrahman, she's a pediatric uh, anesthetic consultant in um, at Aldehey Hospital um, in Liverpool, UK. Uh, you're most than welcome, Dr. Dalia. And the floor is yours. Uh, she's gonna talk about the um, acute, uh, acute management of um, pain management in acute um, pa pediatrics. So. Um, we are happy to have you today here. Thank you very much, uh, Raha, for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen. And um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk about uh, managing acute pain uh, from anesthetic perspective, since uh, we tend to deal with acute uh, pain management more commonly in context of uh, post-operative pain management and also in context of trauma. Um, most of what I'm going to say is going to translate easily to uh, intensive care setting, uh, and although there'll be slight differences in practice uh, and the context of um, uh, patient um, status and physiology. Okay, so um, as we've been through the um, definition of pain, um, it's important to um, emphasize that pain is subjective. Um, it is different from one individual to another. And also, um, it also um, <clears throat> variable for the same individual within different settings. So um, anxiety, um, um, any other uh, physiological variables uh, might add and augment the sensation of pain. And this is very important to uh, bear in mind for the um, individual approach of managing pain, uh, because no one recipe will fit all, even if the same um, two individuals having the same um, medical or surgical condition. <clears throat> so why do we treat pain? Uh, I suppose the obvious call, um, reason is it is humane uh, to provide comfort uh, for individual. Um, but also it is very important to reduce stress response from physiological point of view. Um, as we know, pain is associated with uh, increased sympathetic drive, which uh, result in um, um, cardiovascular uh, augmentation of heart, um, increased heart rate, tachycardia, hypertension, um, and increased respiratory rate. Um, and um, this is also um, could be detrimental for um, critically ill patient and especially patient with um, cardiovascular compromise. Um, the tolerance of the uh, different intervention in a setting of intensive care is important reason why you should have adequate pain relief um, uh, because uh, it's a place where patient experience a uh, high volume and high frequency of interventions, being procedures, being uh, turning uh, or mobilizing the patient uh, or, or just being like intervention like suction. Uh, it is mostly painful uh, procedures uh, in a patient who is having impaired uh, consciousness, whether due to disease entity or because of pharmacological intervention. So managing pain is, it is very important within that setting. Um, adequate pain relief will allow um, mobilization um, and healing. Um, this is um, might be true for post-operative patient, but also in the context of ICU, um, it allow handling of patient without um, increasing uh, their distress and um, allowing for 
physiotherapy and other intervention turning uh, without causing discomfort, which also uh, promote healing. Uh, it prevent infections like respiratory tract infection, uh, venous thrombolysis, skin pressure point, and ulcers. And um, the prevention of acute pain is a mainstay of uh, preventing the chronic pain. When we talk about acute pain, we talk about hours to uh, days, but the chronic pain is a disabling um, pathology that the patient carries for the rest of their life. And it does have um, huge psychological um, and um, overall impact on the patient, um, you know, uh, for their life. And it is very disabling um, issue and, and very difficult to treat. So the best way to tackle that is to, uh, to manage the acute pain uh, in an adequate way. How do we recognize? My colleagues have spoken already about the tools that people use, uh, the different scores um, that has been mentioned before. Um, we, but it's important to mention that we use a combination of uh, vital signs, which could be elevated or altered for other reasons rather than pain. Um, uh, we, we use, that's why the clinical judgment is important. Uh, we use ob uh, observation, the behavior and visual assessment for children. Self-reporting is, is uh, probably the gold standard for somebody who is conscious and who is able to comprehend, but that is usually not the case in children and certainly not the case in the ICU, which make pain recognition is more complex of a task uh, within that setting. And that leads us to... Um, recognize the confounders of uh, pain assessment. So inability to self-report because of the age, uh, and that could be compensated by using other tools. We also have to remember the discrepancy in reporting because um, when we deal with children, we don't deal with children only, we deal with their guardian, be it parents or other relative or guardians in charge um, of looking after the children. So um, we do have to listen to them, but we have to, address there might be some discrepancy in the reporting of the degree of pain uh, if we have a, a verbally uh, able to talk uh, patient. Um, anxiety and fear will either augment the sensation of pain or uh, it could lead to actually hiding the pain on the other side. So that would be um, a child who might be uh, unwilling to, to tell about their pain because there might think there might be more intervention, which could uh, lead to more. <clears throat> um, needless to say that impaired consciousness is an issue um, in ICU, and also delirium is a common issue in ICU, which could be uh, confused in, in a vast majority of time with pain, and sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish which of which, because they might manifest in the same um, um, visual uh, way that we use to distinguish both of them. Um, and as I said, other um, reasons for why this patient might have abnormal uh, vitals. It could be because of circulatory problems or other issues. Um, where do we encounter pain in ICU? Uh, it could be the disease related. Um, that is why the patient has been admitted. It could be a medical condition um, or it could be surgical uh, condition. The patient might be post-operative um, and having to deal with pain in addition to other uh, problems that uh, led them to end up in ICU. And it is important to remember um, pain is a, is a major issue in this patient because they might be facing uh, bigger problems in the, face, in the eye of the caring person in the ICU. Uh, patient also might have trauma, um, which uh, lead them to end in ICU. Um, interventions, um, even the simple ones, uh, could be quite painful and uncomfortable for patient. And, and then the other different procedures that we do on a daily basis on intensive care um, um, are mostly painful. and need to be taken into account uh, when managing pain. Um, so 
Talking about pain management, we talk about pain management in two contexts. One is prevention, uh, which is preemptive analgesia that we give for patients to stop them from uh, experiencing the pain before it starts. Uh, and this is uh, if we need to do um, any procedure or intervention. And it is important to know what is the option available for um, pain relief, which could be quite simple uh, and not very expensive uh, modalities. And also we need to make sure to allow adequate timing for the different medication to work before we start the procedure. This is an important concept and it needs to be uh, calculated by being very organized in, in before uh, doing these procedures. Um, we also um, have a strategy to face with uh, treating existing pain and um, the concept of multimodal approach, which Amal has talked about in her presentation. Um, but I would like to emphasize that in context of ICU, uh, multimodal approach is used all the time. Uh, it's very rarely to find patient being sedated and having an analgesia with a single agent in ICU. Uh, it's usually double agent and sometimes more. And I'm sure that my colleague, my next colleague will, will touch uh, on that. Uh, but also in context of acute pain itself, due to surgery or trauma um, or any other reason, uh, multimodal analgesia is very uh, important in managing the pain. And uh, as we said, in tailoring to individual patient um, is important because you need to be mindful of the contraindication and side effect of the particular drug and whether it's suitable for that patient condition or not. And why we use multimodal approach? Uh, there are several advantages of applying uh, this approach um, because we use um, um, synergistic effect of the medication. Um, we uh, reduce the dose dependent side effect because we could use less doses of each individual medicine. And this is very true for opiates, which is the main treatment for uh, moderate to severe pain. So using adjunct and other uh, similar analgesia in conjunction with this medication uh, will reduce the, the need for higher doses of this medication, which uh, essentially reduces the side effect. Uh, it is also cost effective um, rather than using one single medicine, which might uh, provide good analgesia, but come at a high cost using combination of medicine two, three, or even more uh, would be a very effective way uh, to reduce the cost. And this is very important in the context of uh, central accident. I'm going to talk briefly about some medications. I'm not going to give like um, you know, a full description of uh, how this medication works, but I'm just trying to touch base on some of the common side effects and some of the issues with this, this medication and, and some of the um, advantages of using this medication. Um, we all know paracetamol, um, it is a readily available medicine, it's over the counter, it comes with fewer side effects, um, and it has different route of administration. Um, you can be given uh, internally, um, orally or rectally, and it could be given intravenously as well. Um, paracetamol is um, good as for mild pain, but it's also good as um, adjunct that you could use almost with a lot of other medication uh, in a multimodal approach. Uh, you need to be aware of hepatotoxicity with uh, continuous administration over days, especially in patients in ICU who might have impaired liver function or impaired clearance because of impaired liver, uh, function as well. It is weak and analgesic that's, and also works as antipyretics and it's in anti-inflammatory uh, properties are uh, mild and uh, at the best. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, they're very good for moderate pain. Um, they're very good as adjunct. Uh, they're effective in reducing inflammation and hence they come very handy in post-operative um, analgesia. They come also handy in context of trauma and in uh, reducing pain effectively, especially with bone, involving bone. Uh, they're opioid sparing uh, medication. Um, 
but they do have a lot of side effects that might not be suitable and might limit their use in the context of ICU. Um, they're not contraindicated in ICU setting, but they have to be taken with a great caution and individualized to, uh, to patient um, according to what they need. So in, uh, inhibition of platelet's function uh, would be a problematic in an ICU patient, which might increase the risk of bleeding, especially patient having um, sepsis um, or um, trauma, uh, which might um, reduce um, the hemostasis. So that would be one of the problems with non-steroidals. Um, their antiprostaglandins and they uh, lead to increased risk of ulceration, in the GI tract and renal toxicity, which might uh, exacerbate the acute kidney injury. And hence it might not be suitable in a lot of patients in ICU. Um, and also there are very small percentage of patients who might have asthma exacerbation with use of anti-inflammatory drugs and non -steroidals. Come to the opiate, which are probably the mainstay of treatment of moderate to severe pain, and they're also the main uh, sedative uh, medicines uh, commonly used in the intensive care unit. Um, um, they come um, um, in different um, routes. They can be given um, in different format. So commonly used as infusion for continuous administration in ICU, which allow days and weeks of administration. They are titratable, which is a big advantage. So you can titratable, titrate it to the response to the patient and also titrate it against the vital um, signs and the, to achieve hemodynamic stability. Um, they could be given by multiple routes. And they come with a whole lot of um, side effect, but these side effects, some of them are manageable and some of them you just have to uh, deal with them um, or, or reduce a dose. So uh, respiratory depression, which is dose dependent. And when we remember we're dealing with, with children, the uh, smaller children, the infant and the babies will have more profound respiratory depression because of the immaturity of their um, uh, nervous system. Um, we have hypotension and bradycardia, which come as a confining thing in ICU because you're dealing with patients mostly um, requiring some hemodynamic support anyway. So using opiates in ICU, I might necessitate using of other medication to uh, improve blood pressure. Um, reduced clearance in babies due to immaturity of the renal system as well. So the smaller babies we talk about, um, opiates have to be done with a bit of caution, but they are um, used in, in, in babies from neonatal period, um, but with caution. Um, nausea and vomiting uh, is a big issue um, with uh, opiates, constipation is a, a continuous use or long-term use. They also cause histamine release which lead to um, uh, itching or pruritus. And uh, over time, we get the issue of tolerance, which might need to increase the dose of opiates to achieve the same response. And eventually, people worry about dependence. But I guess if you're talking about ICU setting, this is probably the least of the worry. Uh, and um, you know, um, moderate and balanced use of opiates shouldn't be a problem to cause any dependence. As we said, we come in intramuscular, transmucosal, subcutaneous, transdermal, a uh, variety of routes could be uh, used for opiate administration, which um, provide advantage. Uh, yeah. Hello. Um, the commonly used opiates are morphine, fentanyl. Uh, Ramifentanyl is also used. Uh, it's ultra short acting. Opiates it might not be available in Sudan. Pethidine is a synthetic opiate that's also used, um, and uh, they all come with different variety of um, characteristics that make one or another more suitable um, for use for a particular patient. The next drug is ketamine. Um, ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist. Um, 
the good thing about ketamine that it uh, provides um, anesthesia and analgesia, so it causes amnesia, but it, it, the way it works is slightly unique. Uh, we call it dissociative anesthesia, so it should look might, might look like more awake than uh, anesthetized at the time, but um, they don't recall um, the event afterwards. They have less respiratory depression effect, but they also come with increased secretion. Uh, they have the advantage of causing bronchodilatation, but they might cause some laryngeal spasm and irritation of the upper airway. Um, they're very good for as adjunct treatment for acute pain and in trauma setting, and they use as um, medication to modulate the chronic pain. Uh, and they use also effectively in patients with opiate tolerance for long-term use of opiates. Um, they provide cardiovascular stability, but this is dose dependent. So I wouldn't say uh, ketamine is cardiovascular stable all the time, but they're very good for the slime drugs for uh, initiating, for example, uh, anesthesia and anesthetizing patient or managing the airway in a very stable patient. But you have to use a smaller doses as well, because if you use um, large doses, you end up with the same uh, cardiovascular instability and hypertension like any other medication we use. Um, they can be given in full doses and they use it in infusions, and they're very good for uh, pain, as I said. Uh, Um, ketamine also causes uh, increased incidence of nausea and rising ICB and increased perfusion of the pain. So, as Amal said, uh, take it with caution in context of traumatic brain injury. But if you have to choose between having increased ICB anyway because of coughing, straining, a moving patient, and pain, and uh, the effect of ketamine, I would choose ketamine because definitely less, and that could be planted by using other agents like benzodiazepines. Um, ketamine is very good medicine to give in small doses for painful procedures, like if you want to insert a chest drain, um, um, for example, or any, uh, any other painful procedure in the ICU, uh, could be used in a very small doses, and, and it would be provide good analgesia and, and also short acting, um, in addition to its use uh, for airway management and uh, infusions. Other medicines um, that are used for uh, providing analgesia and sedation, and um, they're coming very good and very popular, uh, are alpha-2 antagonists, um, talking about clonidine, um, which is Sedative, it is uh, good for preserving the respiratory drive. It's a very good analgesic, but it used as adjunct mainly. Uh, it, it is good for managing uh, delirium, uh, and also it helps with opioid withdrawal uh, in patients have been, been through the ICU. Um, uh, clonidine causes hypertension and bradycardia. Um, because of global sympathetic drive, and this could be problematic sometimes in using this medication. Dexmedetomidine is more selective agent and is gaining more popularity in intensive care setting. It's used for sedation, um, as infusion, uh, it is titratable. It also comes with bradycardia and hypertension, and you may be aware that there's some concern recently from some recent trials that might not be very good for younger patients under 65, but um, I'm not quite sure if this will be um, relatable to pediatric because we usually have very um, little evidence in pediatric and we just extrapolate from the adult studies. Um, lastly, I'm going to talk about regional anesthesia and local anesthetic. Local anesthetic are used more commonly in the context of managing acute pain in outside ICU, but they also have a good role in ICU. And people managing ICU, they should need to be aware of them because they might have to look after a patient who had um, uh, some of these block um, or uh, procedures done before they arrive to ICU. Um, we have long and short acting local anesthetic. Uh, we have a variety of local anesthetics in use. We can use um, bibuvacaine um, and Lidocaine, these are the commonly used uh, local anesthetic. 
They can also come plain or they could be added with additive like adrenaline and they use commonly to provide some local vesicle restriction for certain procedures. And they also use adrenaline to prolong the action of the local anesthetic because the local anesthetic stays longer on the site. It's used for local infiltration and doesn't get absorbed to the systemic circulation uh, as quickly. Um, they're good for procedures in ICU. Uh, for lines, drains, and IV access. Um, and the local anesthetic could be used for briefer regional block, which is more complex technique used uh, mainly by the anesthetist, uh, but also used by a &E and could be used in intensive care. Um, and, and the blocks, regional blocks, could be central, like paravertebral, epidural, caudal, uh, or even spinal technique, and um, could be used as peripherally um, as blocking different nerve point to one limb or one side of the body um, or in the trunk. And it could be used as symbol infiltration around the site you intend to do procedure or after procedure. Uh. Sorry, could you just um, Local acid could be used as a single shot or single injection or can also use uh, as continuous infusion via catheter. Uh, we do send patients to intensive care and infusion um, having had a uh, peripheral or central and your axial blockage, but I'm not quite sure this is uh, the case in Sudan. But having said that, this is a potential thing. They're very good for providing pain relief for patient having significantly a major procedure, and they actually reduce the need for uh, other sedation and in intensive care. Um, they require additional monitoring, uh, which add more burden if they have been um, used. Um, they also need to monitor for neurotoxicity, uh, which in the worst case scenario might cause uh, either seizure or cardiac arrest. But this is uh, very rare uh, when given in, in uh, routine doses. Um, local anesthetic, if used in central technique, tend to cause, again, hypertension and they tend to cause bradycardia. And this is also because of their sympathetic blockage um, property. And again, that is something uh, they share with other medication used for. Um, uh, providing analgesia. Um, this is coming to the end of my talk and thank you very much. I'll be happy to take some questions later. Thank you so much, Daphne, for a really um, good talk. Sorry, I'm gonna mute Dahlia because there's an echo. Um, yeah, I think don't, there's no echo at the moment. So thank you so much. That's really helpful. And it's really a nice presentation about how we need to manage acutely um, um, patient with ha children with having a pain and um, yes if you have the, um, anyone in the uh, in the attendees if there's any question just drop it I start seeing a few questions coming to the chat and we have a slot I think like a 10-15 minutes in the, in the end of the session to answer all these questions um, so our next Dr. Ahmed Bin Mahfouz. Um, he's a pediatric uh, um, critical care consultant and head of the pediatric department in uh, Care National Hospital. He graduated from uh, Jordan University for Technology, so for Science and Technology, and he got his fellowship in pediatric critical care uh, from Saudi abroad. Um, Dr. Ahmed, he got a, lo a long experience in pediatric critical care and medical education, and he got a master's degree in health and medical simulation from University of um, Hertfordshire from UK and his special interest in neuro critical care, ICU liberation, medical education and simulation. We are so glad to have you today and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Rehab. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation, Dr. Rehab. I'm really happy to participate in such great initiative. It's really inspiring and uh, encouraging. Okay. Is the slides clear? Yes, we can see it clearly. Okay, this may... 
So we're going to talk today about using sedation in the pediatrics critical care in specific and in pediatrics uh, department in general. So, sorry. Yeah. Maybe. So the objectives we will go through many, many things. The first we'll talk about indications of using the sedation medications and what's the target when we use these medications. Then we will go through the uh, objective method in assessing the sedation level, which is the sedation assessment tools. We'll go through instructions, few instructions before giving the sedation. And the question, what is the ideal sedative agent? And we will talk about the sedative and the analgesic medications, their mechanism of works. Then we will end our talk about speaking of the withdrawal effects and dependence and what can be uh, an appropriate winning approach. Sorry. Moving. Okay. So we have multiple admissions to use the sedation in the pediatrics critical care. First of all is when a patient is requiring intubation, usually we are providing the patient with a proper sedation before intubating him to decrease the anxiety and also to prevent the patient from fighting the physician while he is intubating him, which will decrease the possibility of developing upper airway uh, trauma. And after intubating this patient, he will be connected most likely to a mechanical ventilator machine. And this machine needs the patient to synchronize well with the machine. So we are keeping the patient on continuous infusions to prevent any asynchrony with the machines, which will affect the gas exchange and would increase the oxygen consumption. Also, when we have patients in the pediatrics ICU, Mainly those cases will require, or some of these cases will require some painful procedures like inserting chest tube, central line insertions, uh, lumbar punctures, abdominal tapping. All these procedures need agents which have sedative effect and an analgesic effect to control also the pain and to make the patient's experience inside the ICU a pleasant experience with less uh, psycho psychological trauma. Also, one of these procedures is removing the chest tube where many people think it's not a painful procedure and uh, it's really a painful one. Uh, during staying in the pediatrics ICU, most of the ICU prevents the parents from staying with their kids inside the ICU. So this will cause a separation anxiety for those kids, especially if the kid was uh, awake and he was not on heavy sedations. So providing the patient with sedation will decrease this separation and anxiety. So what's our target when we give a sedation for any patient? Our target is to provide the patient with an adequate sedation, but with the lowest, with the lowest possible side effects. It's not an easy decision. These medications that that comes without risk and side effects. So whenever we are giving a medication, we, re we want to reach the, uh, the optimum sedation but we need to keep in our eyes the obstacles, which is the side effects of this medication and also the dependence, tolerance and withdrawal symptoms for this medications. Just to, to go quickly with general words about what's the meaning of tolerance, dependence and, and withdrawal symptoms. Tolerance means when the patient uses the medication and he cannot stay without this medications later on. Or sorry, this is dependence. And tolerance means the receptors in the patient's body get tolerated to this dose of medication and you need, to, you need to increase the dose of sedation to achieve the therapeutic desire. And the withdrawal symptoms is when you try to wean the patient from the sedation or discontinue the sedation, usually the patient will develop what's called withdrawal symptoms, which really are uh, unpleasant symptoms and we are trying to prevent them from happening. And if we could not at least prevent them, we are trying to please the side effects and the, uh, sorry, the withdrawal symptoms as much as we can by different approaches. And we will come to these different approaches. So how can we reach the adequate sedation without with the minimum side effects that can appear? Usually it's better to go with objective criteria than going with subjective criteria. So we have multiple sedation assessment tools Personally, I prefer the Comfort B scale. The Comfort B scale can be used uh, to have a lot of details. Usually we are checking eight parameters and we are grading each one of these parameters with five grades. So we sum the total at the end and we are checking 
what's the figure that we are having if the patient level the comfort behavior uh, b scale is more than 17 that means the patient is very awake and we need to increase the sedation level and the sedation doses if the the level is between 12 to 17 that means the patient is comfortable but uh, sorry if uh, yeah the patient is comfortable and he is he is achieving adequate sedation if the sedation is reaching between 10 to 12 that means we should start considering weaning the patient from sedation because he is sedated well but he is a little bit having over sedation but if the level is less than 10 that means the patient is heavily sedated he is uh, knocked out and we need to decrease the sedation doses or to decrease the medication that pro providing the sedations. Another tool which is used mainly in the, with the adult population uh, is an old one, which is, uh, which is the RAM desedation scale score. It's not uh, uh, described well and not detailed as the comfort B scale. It's only classified into six grades. Uh, from grade four to six is considered as optimum sedation and one, two, three grades considered to, uh, we should consider to increase the uh, sedation doses to reach the, uh, the adequate sedation. So let's go to the $1 million question. What is the ideal sedation agent? Unfortunately, there is no ideal sedation agents uh, for all patients in the pediatric critical care. Usually we are choosing our agents depends on two things, the patient's disease, clinical condition, and the indication for sedation. For example, if a patient was having status asthmaticus and he required to be intubated, we prefer to choose an agent which can provide the patient with sedative effect, but also have other properties like bronchodilatation. So ketamine will be a good choice because it have those two properties. Another example, if the patient was having traumatic brain injury. So we prefer to provide a, an agent with sedative effect, but on the other hand, this agent better to have an effect to decrease the cranial metabolic demands, like the thiobentan, the propofol, and these agents. But we found that in the pediatrics age group, most of the cases uh, have good effect if we have a combination of both the opiates and the benzodiazepines. And that's why it's used mainly in most of the pediatrics ICU-4 infusions. There are some few instructions which should be known before giving any sedations. So first of all, you should address what's the level of consciousness that you need your patient to be in. So for example, if we are classifying these patients into four categories. First, the first designation is grade one, which is the minimum sedation. Like when a patient is, an, is having anxiety and you need only to provide an anxiolysis agent or an anxiolytic agent, like one dose, small dose of benzodiazepine. But if you want your patient to have a moderate sedation, what we call the conscious sedation for a short procedure, painful procedure, for example, we should provide him with more sedations. We can provide him with ketamine, with fentanyl, with small dose also of midazolam to achieve that conscious sedation. If you want your patient to reach a deep sedation, like an intubated patient inside the ICU, you should increase your sedation doses and you should uh, apply one of the sedation assessment tools to reach this level. And level four is considered for general anesthesia and the OR. So before giving the sedation, you, you should ask few questions in the history. You should know about the medication history for the patient, any allergy, any non-allergy for any medications or any food. And you should ask about the last feeding when, when the last meal was taken. Uh, also any previous experience with sedation and anesthesia. And if that happened before, did the patient develop any side effects from those sedations? Also from the examination, you should examine the patient just at least to be sure that this patient does not have uh, a query difficult airways. So if the patient after sedation, for example, develop respiratory depression, you will be able to secure the upper airways and bag the patient properly. Or if you think that this patient is having difficult airways, you will ask for help before giving the sedation from an expert person. Also, you should pay a great attention for the documentations. 
we are in the era of the medical legal issues so you should pay uh, 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 meticulous attention to this to this thing you should take an informed consent from the parents or from the the legal guardian for the patient and also you should give a clear instruction for the responsible person who will give the uh, sedation if you were planning to give a moderate sedation you should put more things in your mind other than examining the patient considering difficult airways. Also, you should keep in your mind that this patient might have some sequelae from this sedation. He might develop vasodilatation, which will cause hypovolemia. So if the patient developed this hypovolemia, you should have a peripheral line also to provide him with a bolus of IV fluid tenement per kilogram to uh, improve his hypovolemia and hypo, uh, to improve his uh, hypotension. So what are the guidelines to keep the patient MPO before procedures in the pediatrics ICU and short procedures also outside the pediatrics ICU? For children, we should keep, keep them MPO for six hours from solid food and non-clear liquids like milk. And for clear liquids like water, we should keep them MPO for three hours only. But if the patient was less than three months or a new uh, four hours is sufficient for the milk and two hours is sufficient for the clear fluids. Uh, whenever we are giving sedation, we should keep in, in our mind that we, the patient might develop some complications. So what are the main reasons for these complications? First of all is providing the patient with over sedation, either high dose of sedation or multiple doses of sedation. That's why it's very important to document all the doses and the boluses of sedation that uh, will be given or was given to the patient. Also, if the patient was kept with inadequate monitoring during the procedure or after the procedure. One of the sad stories happened before. One of the cases went for a minimum procedure. It was a, a, a very easy procedure, a lac lacrimal duct dilatation. And after the procedure, he was left in the recovery room uh, without having proper monitoring. Unfortunately, the patient was desatting. No one paid attention to that desatting episode till the patient collapsed. They, the patient arrested. They did the resuscitation for the patient for 18 minutes. Then the patient picked up. Unfortunately, it ended catastrophically uh, with severe hypoxic ischemic insult and the patient uh, ended as a CP patient while he was a normal patient before. And that's why it's very important to pay uh, attention for monitoring the patient during giving the sedation and after giving the, the sedation in the recovery period. And if the patient was outside the ICU, never ever discharge the patient home if he was in the ER before the patient recovered from the sedation. Also, if the patient, uh, if the person who was providing and administrating the sedation was lacking the experience and he had no experience before if, of giving the sedation, or if he was lacking the knowledge of the side effects and the doses of these medications. And that's why we anyone should know about the, the proper dose of the medication. You should have a reference for the medications, either uh, a written reference, or if you are familiar with this medication and you are using them frequently, you should recall the doses of these medications. Moreover, you should know about the common side effects which might appear when you give the medications. And so you should also, when you give a sedation, you should keep in your mind that, or you should keep uh, beside the patient, uh, many things like the intubation set and also the uh, antidote if the patient was receiving medication which had antidote. We will go through these classes of medications. Almost these are the most common used medications in the pediatrics ICUs and also in the ward and the pediatrics ER. They are opiates, benzodiazepines, ketamine, barbiturates, alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, chloral hydrates, and propofol. But before discussing these medications in details, let's go to the mechanism of work because most of them share the same mechanism of work. We have many receptors in the CNS system, but two of the main receptors are the GABA receptors and the glutamate receptors, which is also called the NMDA receptors. So the GABA receptors is an inhibitor receptors and the glutamate receptors is an excitatory one. So most of the medications work by uh, initiating and enhancing the inhibition effect in the GABA receptors. 
So they are working as agonists on the GABA receptors. And these medications, some of these medications are the benzodiazepines like midazolam, the barbiturates like phenobarb, propofol, and etomidate. One of the medication is working in, in, the other, in the other receptors, which is the glutamate receptors. It works as uh, antagonist to the excitatory receptors. So it will decrease and inhibit the excitation, which is the ketamine. So sometimes it's better to use a combination of both. One of them will work on the GABA receptors as agonists, and the second one will go work on the glutamate receptors as an uh, inhibition for the excitation by the glutamate receptors. The opioids have different uh, way of our mechanism of force. We'll, go, we'll not go into these details, but it works on the mu1, mu2 receptors. And sometimes some of these opioid receptors works on the uh, uh, delta receptors, sigma receptors, and the cab receptors. The first class is the opioids. Uh, the opioids contains many medications, but the most uh, common use medications are the fentanyl, remifentanyl, morphine, and the tramadol. The fascinating thing about the opioid is it works as analgesic, put, potent analgesic medications. Some of these opioids have minor effect on the uh, sedative, uh, sedative, uh, minor sedative effects. So most of these opioids, if they were used with small doses, they will not affect the level of consciousness, especially the morphine. But also they have side effects, which is the common side effects, the respiratory depression, the hemodynamic instability in form of hypotension, bradycardia. Also some of these opioids might cause stool retention and urine retention, and it might cause also a GI discomfort. The antidote for the opioids, all the opioids, is the naloxone, which can be used with any one of these opioids. The first one we mentioned is the fentanyl. The fentanyl is a very potent medication. It's 100 times more potent than the, uh, the uh, morphine. So it can be used with intubated patients. And one of the things about fentanyl, it does not cause a histamine release like the morphine. So it can be used with cases of bronchial asthma. Uh, one of the rare side effects is the rig rigid chest syndrome. Uh, it's a rare phenomenon. I never saw with any cases, I never saw the side effect with any case before. Usually it happens if the case was provided with a high dose, a large bolus of uh, fentanyl, five mic per kilogram. And we usually treat it by providing the patient with muscle relaxant and the antidote The second medication, uh, from the opioids is the remifentanil. The remifentanil is the cousin of the fentanyl. It's a synthetic agent, also more potent than the fentanyl. The good thing about the remifentanil, it, it does not have metabolism in the liver. The metabolism of remifentanil happens in the RBCs. It's called Hoffman degradation or, or plasma esterase. So it, it's a good choice to be used in case where the patient is having acute liver failure or acute renal failure and have a short half-life but uh, be careful not to give it as a bolus because it has a very potent respiratory depression. So my personal, uh, my personal recommendation is not to give it as a bolus, just give it as infusion. The morphine is used commonly with, uh, with acute chest syndrome in the ER for patients uh, who have uh, suture for suturing or uh, who needs a, a, a pain uh, control medication without affecting his level of consciousness. But uh, you should keep in your mind that the morphine is a histamine releaser, so it, it might cause pruritus. And also you should use it with caution for cases of bronchial asthma uh, because it can cause also a bronchospasm. The tramadol, unfortunately, it's not an FDA approved medication to be used for pediatrics cases, but honestly, we are using it in our pediatrics ICU and we never faced any complications. Usually the dose is between one to two milligram per kilogram every six hours. The good thing about it, it, it can be given orally and also it have on, only an analgesic effect, but it does not have any sedative effects. Let's go now to the medications which have a potent sedation effect, sedative effect. And some of them, most of them does not have any, uh, any control uh, to pain, but some of them have minor control to pain or, or also 
uh, significant control to pain. We will come to them in details and uh, we will mention uh, the, the effect for each one. So the first one is the benzodiazepine. The common medications which is used in the benzodiazepine is diazepam, lorazepam, and midazolam. It can cause muscle relaxation and it can be used also as anticonvulsant. The benzodiazepine is a dose dependent adverse effects medication. Whenever you are increasing the doses, expect to see higher side effects and more side effects in terms of respiratory depression and hemodynamic instability. So if the patient was, if you increase the dose and the patient started to be bradycardic or hypotensive, you can decrease the dose and you will see the, uh, the heart rate will improve and the blood pressure might also improve dramatically. If the patient developed toxicity to benzodiazepine, you can give the antidote with, which is the flamazine. But also, Pay attention if the patient was known case of seizure disorder. If you provide him with the antidote, if he was having a toxic level of benzodiazepines with toxic side effects, uh, you, you, should, you should keep in your mind that this patient is known case of seizure disorder. So if you provide him with flamazenil and the patient develops seizure disorder, you cannot use the benzodiazepine during that time to control the seizure. The midazolam. It's a common medication used in the pediatrics ICU to have, uh, uh, it's considered as a short acting uh, benzodiazepine and it can be used for intubated patient with continuous infusions. The lorazepam is having an intermediate action, lorazepam. The intermediate action of lorazepam make it a good choice to be used as a boluses in cases of status admeticus when you receive those, status epilepticus, sorry, when you, see, you receive these cases in the pediatrics ER. The uh, side effects or the, the difference between lorazepam and the midazolam in, in terms of preparation, the lorazepam is prepared in propylene glycol. So if you use this medication for prolonged infusion, you might develop later on, or the patient might develop later on uh, metabolic acidosis, hyperosmolar metabolic acidosis with lactic acidosis. And that's why with cardiac arrhythmia, we prefer not to use lorazepam for infusion, only for to treat the patient in boluses. Uh, now let's go to the third class, which is the barbiturates. Uh, famous examples are the phenobarbitone and the thiobentam. So the barbiturates are not usually commonly used as sedative agents for in the pediatrics ICU. Usually we are using the phenobarb as anticonvulsant medications, but it can be also used uh, in special cases uh, where the patients, where we are doing cycling for the sedations. And if the patient was not responding also to the other medications, it can be used. The thiobentam is uh, a good choice to be used in cases of traumatic brain injury because it usually decreases the, uh, the cranial metabolic demands. Ketamine, we consider it as a joker in the pediatrics ICU because it's one of the medication which have a great and potent analgesic and sedative effects on, on the same time. So it's an excellent uh, choice to be used in cases of short procedures, short painful procedures. Uh, we are using it uh, usually uh, if we have a patient uh, who will do a, a painful short procedures. And also we sometimes use it for pre-intubation and use it as infusion for intubated patients. Uh, the side effects of ketamine, it have, uh, the good thing about ketamine, it have a bronchodilatation effect. So it can be used in cases of bronchial asthma, but the side effects, it have some, uh, some uh, delusions and hallucinations. Uh, so that's why, it's expected to see patients to hallucinate after receiving the ketamine, and it's better not to be used for patients who is known to have severe psychiatric history. If the patient developed this uh, hallucinations, you can uh, provide him with benzodiazepine, uh, and it's better to use the, the ketamine in combination with benzodiazepine to decrease the possibility of developing this uh, delirium and hallucinations. The uh, fifth uh, class is the alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. The most famous medication is the dexamidetomidine, which is known as Predidex. Uh, this is a new medication. Maybe it's used only in the pediatrics ICU for the last 10 years. 
the the this medication have mainly sedative effect, but also it have some minor analgesic effect. The fascinating thing about the Presidex, it, uh, it does not affect uh, the respiration of the patient. So it can be used for patients without securing his upper airways while the patient is having spontaneous breathing. The side effects which is expected with the Presidex is the uh, bradycardia and hypotension. And when you give a bolus of Presidex, the patient might develop hypertension. So it's better not to provide the patient with boluses and only give it as infusions. It's an effective medication and uh, personally I prefer to use it, but unfortunately it's not FDA approved to be used for more than 24 hours in the pediatrics as an infusion in the pediatrics ICU. Chloral hydrate is a very common medication used usually with non-painful procedures, like when we send a patient for MRI, ECG, EEG, or echo, for example. It has only a sedative effect and it does not have any analgesic effect. But when we use the chloral hydrate, usually the dose is between 50 to 75 milligram per kilogram. We should keep in our mind that it, it, it is associated with respiratory depression. Propofol, this is the white milky uh, medication. The Propofol, it's not used frequently in the pediatrics ICU. The good thing about Propofol, it have an, uh, uh, an amazing on and off effect. So when you start, and that's because of the rapid redistribution of the Propofol. So it's have a short rapid half-life, it's acting immediately. And once you stop the Propofol, the recovery is very quick. So it's, it's really a good choice to be used for short procedures like uh, bronchoscopy inside the pediatrics ICU. But you, you should also keep in your mind the side effects, which is the hypotension, bradycardia, respiratory depression. And during, if the patient requires the probofol infusion for a long time, he might develop also what's called the probofol infusion syndrome, uh, which manifests with refractory metabolic acidosis. So we should keep these things in our mind when we use the probofol. Uh, unfortunately, after the, the death of the famous singer, uh, Michael Jackson, he passed away because an, an, uh, of, the, of uh, using an overdose of Propofol, uh, started to be more restricted medications. So this schedule is demonstrating the analgesia and sedative effects for almost all the medications that we talked about. Uh, as you can see that most of the medications have sedation effect, but few of them is, is having only analgesic effect. So whenever you are choosing a medication, you should choose it wide, wisely. If the patient uh, was going for a painful procedure, you should use a medication which have an analgesic effect, not only sedative effect. And if the patient was going to a procedure with, with, which the, doesn't have, which is not painful and does not have uh, any painful elements, you can use uh, an, a medication with sedative effect only, but you should keep in your mind the side effects of this medication and the disease that this patient is having. Now let's talk about uh, the withdrawal effects of these medications. So whenever you are using a sedative sedation medications or analgesic medications, uh, we should expect that the patient will develop later on withdrawal effects once we start decreasing the sedation doses or stopping these sedations. So, Usually we are seeing the withdrawal symptoms with the benzodiazepines and opioids more than the other medications. It depends mainly on the duration of using these medications and the doses of these medications. So the, usually we are seeing the withdrawal symptoms if the patient was on these medications for five days and more inside the pediatrics ICU, especially if, if the dose of these medications was high uh, because the patient was developing uh, tolerance to the medication every now and then, and we were forced to increase the dose of these medications. So we have approach with these medications, with the withdrawal symptoms. Our approach is aiming to prevent having any withdrawal symptoms, or at least to decrease the possibility uh, of the occurrence of these withdrawal symptoms. So we usually start by decreasing, there are multiple approaches, but this is one of the excellent approaches is to decrease the sedation by 10%. So if we started, if we were on uh, midazolam, for example, on four mic per kilogram per minute, 
we start decreasing the midazolam or the, the midazolam by 0 0.4, 0 0.4 mic per kilogram per minute, either once or twice per day. And once we reach uh, low dose for the midazolam, for example, if we reach one mic per kilogram per minute, we can do an overlapping by uh, introducing a new medication from the same class, but this medication, new medication should have lower potency and high half-life. Like in cases of benzodiazepine, we can start using the lorazepam, which is the same from the same class, but have lower potency than the midazolam and longer half-life. And with time, we should space this medication. This is alternative medication. So we can, for example, for the lorazepam, we can start it Q6 hours for three days, then Q8 hours for three days, then Q12 hours for three days, then OD for three days. So we can win the medication over days uh, up to two weeks till we discontinue the alternative medications. And during that time, we'll be able also to de decrease and discontinue the main medication. Uh, if the patient was, for example, an opioid, we are using methadone or morphine for that purpose. So what are the manifestation of sedation, uh, of withdrawal of sedation? Usually we are seeing uh, tachycardia and tachypnea. Also the patient will have mood swings. He might have hypertension or hypotension. Uh, also the patient might have sweating, tremor, uh, lacrimations, rhinorrhea, uh, diarrhea, uh, muscle pain, and specifically abdominal pain also GI discomfort like nausea and vomiting. Fever can be also one of these manifestations. So during weaning the patient from the sedation, we should observe for all these withdrawal symptoms. If the patient was developing these withdrawal symptoms and those symptoms were severe enough, we should hold the weaning for a while and provide the patient with boluses to decrease the withdrawal symptoms. And we can also provide the patient with boluses from other sedations sedation medication to, to decrease the withdrawal symptoms and also to keep weaning the patient from that medication. Uh, these schedules are demonstrating also the NHS uh, uh, approach in decreasing the, uh, in decreasing the, and weaning the sedations. Uh, it's almost the same as I mentioned before. Just look for an approach and follow this up. So the take messages from this presentation is uh, you should know about your sedation. There is no ideal sedation medication and you should know about your medication uh, in terms of side effects and doses when you provide these medications. And uh, the, the last thing you should observe and monitor your patient during giving the sedation and in the recovery period after the sedation. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. This is really informative. And we, you talked about all the, uh, actually asked most of the questions in the, in the chat about what the drug of choice for a certain diseases and how um, we need to think logically when we have a patient, what we need to do with, with a con clinical condition and what the pros and cons about uh, using the uh, sedation. Thank you so much, that's really informative. Um, so I think we, we finished the sessions and we are now uh, going to take the um, answer the questions in the chat. Uh, actually, I have like a two um, uh, just like um, um, uh, observations or something I've just noticed from my practice here in in UK. So uh, about the chest rigidity, I did see that like quite a lot in the neonatal period. And I just want to mention this here because Dr. Ahmed in Sudan, um, some places they do have like a separate NICU, but some of the PICU, they're still seeing uh, any natal uh, patients and admitting them. So I just want to highlight for the people, I've noticed a few patients while I'm working in NICU, they do have like a chest rigidity while we um, giving the fentanyl pre-intubation. And I think the only thing we can do is just try to flush the fentanyl or give the fentanyl very slowly. If you can do that, uh, I know in neonate it's really very tiny amount of medicine, but we need to flush it very slowly over five minutes. That we're gonna guard again is having a chest rigidity. Um, so there's just that one something I want to highlight. The other thing is, uh, I've noticed from my practice whenever you escalating the sedation, 
you you started with, for example, midazolam and morphine, and you're going up up, and you're not willing to sedate and calm the patient. Always think about the, uh, the vascular axis. Think about is this medicine is delivered to your patient or no. Just put this in your routine, especially with the nurses, because we do have a lot of nurses logging today here and attend this session with us. Think about the vascular axis. Make sure that the central line is working and this particular medication is delivered to your patient. Then we need to revisit again and see what we need to do. Okay. Um, thank you so much. So I'm going to go through the um, questions here in the chat. Uh, I think the first question is to Dr. Amal. So uh, this is from Dr. Maha. She's saying that thank you very much for your talk. And from your experience, uh, our two-month PQ uh, rotation for the registrar is enough to, to be familiar with the sedation. Uh, if not, uh, what the, sorry, I'm going to leave you, and then I will uh, ask you. So the question is to you, if two months experience in a PQ as a rotation for a resident, this is enough to know how to be familiar with the sedation? And if not, what are the steps suggested by keep me safe toward fixing this? So I'll leave the, the first part of the question to answer, Amel, and I will answer the rest of the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maha, for your question. Uh, actually, no, two months is very little period uh, to practice ICU in general, or Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, so, we can hear you, Amal, yes. So it's a, it's a short period, actually, Maha, and rehab, and we have talked to the uh, Sudan Specialization Board, which are responsible for rotation of registrars, and we are seeking them to increase the period in ICU to at least six months, just like NECU. Okay, thank you, thank you, Amel. So um, I, I do agree, uh, Maha, with uh, with Dr. Amel that it's really short period to get all the things. Uh, it's not only the sedation, all the things in how to deal with the critical patient in ICU in uh, in only two months. This is too short time. Um, from from us as a Keep Me Safe project, that's why we've done this session just to 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 tell the people uh, to to help the people to know exactly what the sedation, what we need to use. And particularly, we put the session from Sudan to tell us the challenges and the, the obstacles they are facing. And I think this is going to be my next question to the, our speaker today, uh, especially Dr. Dalia, because she's been she's visiting, visiting Sudan a lot of times and she um, do have an experience about what's available in Sudan and how the anesthetic team, they can support the ICU team pain sedation. And also I will, uh, if Dr. Ahmed, he had any experience to tell us what we need to do in a very limited resource country. So that's why we've done this session. Um, I think uh, in, a ver in the, our course in uh, February, the virtual course, or uh, we have a session talking about pain and sedation, and it will be the similar talk, talk about um, different modalities of uh, sedating patients in, and um, given analgesia in ICU. So this is we, our part, what we can do. Uh, I think in the future we think about developing a pain team and anesthesia because usually here in the UK, for example, there is a pain team in a hospital. They work together, the anesthetist and the PIC team to deal with the patient, especially if we have a patient that is really difficult to uh, sedate or uh, really difficult to be pain-free. For example, sickler, they can come in sickle cell crisis and we, ma we reach the maximum of ketamine and a lot of things going on and he still is in pain. So at that time, this is the rule for the pain team. And I think we do need to think in the future to establish a pain team in Sudan if not available at the moment. So this is the, the answer for the other part. Um, Dalia, do you want to add anything for what I've said? Um, uh, thanks, Arham. I think um, just going back to the question of two months rotation, um, not that I'm familiar with the um, rotation in, in Sudan, but for four-year rotation overall, I think if you're not intending to do uh, intensive care as a career, um, it's usually two to three months um, is probably enough. And the reason for being in ICU is not to 
make your experience in managing ICU, it's rather to give you insight um, to uh, how ICU work. This is an ideal world. I think in Sudan, unfortunately, the people with two months rotation end up being um, the main um, uh, personnel looking after ICU. Um, and that create the dilemma, but um, if, if we, um, and hopefully there is an ICU um, subspeciality established, um, that shouldn't be an issue uh, in the future. Um, because I think uh, there's a lot of to cover during rotation apart from ICU. Um, in terms of uh, the association between uh, anesthetic service, pain management, and, and ICU, this is this is a big problem. I think in Sudan, even even within um, acute pain service, is is lagging even in for post-operative patient. Um, so and and the way to to overcome this in a short term, I think, by maybe focusing more on further education and training to upskill the people working in ICU and also by um, adopting guidelines uh, because all ICUs work with a set of uh, guidelines which could be adapted to what is available in Sudan. I think uh, it's clearly from the question um, I can see in the chat that people are worried about using things because of lack of experience, but not that the medication are not available, which is another issue. So I think if we focus on making simplified guidelines that people could follow um, and have it as a reference, I think that might help in temporarily um, elevating this problem. Thank, thank you, Dahlia, for, for your um, answer. Um, I think the next question is um, from, uh, they didn't mention the name, but they, they asking about what sedation, which sedation can be used safely in patients with mental health condition um, or um, with a patient aggressive behavior, especially when they present in ED. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, if you have, uh, you can answer that question. Uh, yes, um, we can use if the patient present with an aggressive behavior in the uh, in the emergency room. It's better to use an anxiolytic agent like the midazolam, and also you you can use uh, opioids uh, for for sedation because initially we not have an idea about the reason and the cause of this aggressive behaviors. Is it because encephalitis, for example, or is it because this patient does have uh, a psychiatric disorders? So it's better to use. A benzodiazepine in combination with opioids during that episode. And uh, I just received, I saw another question and I was reading the questions uh, in the list regarding using ketamine. Uh, if you allow me, Dr. I have to answer that question. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Cool. It's regarding using ketamine in cases of uh, traumatic brain injury. So, and in cases of bronchial asthma that it might cause excessive secretions. That's an excellent question. Uh, regarding the traumatic brain injury, in the past, they were saying that you cannot use, it's contraindicated to use ketamine because it might cause an increase in the ICP, intracranial pressure. But in the recent years, many studies came out uh, and uh, this, uh, this practice have been changed. So in the last, let's say five to 10 years, many papers, strong papers with uh, randomized control trials came out talking about using ketamine in high ICP cases is not contraindicated anymore. So if you have a case with traumatic brain injury, you can use ketamine safely, especially if you don't have other medications. And also for using the ketamine during the bronchoscopy, it, it, it's right that it can cause an excessive secretions, which, which might uh, lead to difficult dealing during the bronchoscope and doing the bronchoscopy. So there is another solution by giving the patient anticholinergic agent like atropine. Uh, to decrease these secretions and to give the patient uh, the ketamine as a sedation, especially if you were working in a limited resources uh, place mm -hmm. where the ketamine is the only choice you have. Perfect. Thank you so, thank you so much for this, um, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I can see Dr. Mohammed Siddiq, he's raising his hand. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, you can uh, unmute yourself and drop your comment or um, ask the question you want to ask. Assalamu alaikum. My, my voice is clear. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Oh. Uh, th thank you so much. Keep me safe. Uh, 
for uh, helping us in Sudan by training the people in the course and continue, continuously training through these uh, workshops and uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, I'm happy to see there is many candidates, around 80 candidates uh, participating in this uh, meeting. And I just want to explore that uh, um, what we have now in Sudan is, 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 is really promising. Uh, we cannot say that within the five years past, the situation was really miserable. Uh, we have now many units in pediatric uh, intensive care and pediatric heart intensive care serving critical patients. And I, I believe that uh, these courses is add a lot to the people working in this uh, uh, ICUs to help the patients. Uh, I, I think continuity of these programs uh, will help a lot people in limited resources such like Sudan. And I think the ultimate solution for all our problems is to have some fellowships in the pediatric intensive care. Uh, I'm happy about what we have now from the continuity of the training. Uh, thank you. Keep me safe for this event and keep it. Let's do it. Let's do this together. Shukran jazeera. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Um, for the people that don't know, how Dr. Mohammed is a, um, one of the pediatric cardiac intensive uh, intensivists in Sudan and is working in, currently in Sudan Heart Center. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, let's go back to the chat. Um, I think there is a question here. Can we use a small dose of phenytoin? or phenobarbital to sedate a patient on CPAP if they are fighting? So Dr. Ahmad, that's yours to answer. Uh, no, I, I prefer if the patient wasn't having a secured upper airways, I prefer not to use the phenobarbital because it's a potent medication. Uh, it's better to use other alternatives, medications like small dose of midazolam or uh, Prezidex, for example which will not affect the respiratory reflexes a lot. That's the idea. Um, but if you don't have any other resources, you can use a very small dose, a very small dose of phenobarb. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there is a question from Ahmed Abdullah, uh, pros and cons of using codeine or oromor for moderate to severe pain in pediatrics. Uh, Dr. Dari, are you um, able to answer that question? Sorry, um, pros and cons of using oromorph uh, or codeine uh, for moderate to severe pain in pediatrics. Yeah, so um, oromorph is used commonly to manage um, moderate to severe pain, um, and um, we do send a lot of patients in pediatric um, hospital to the ward with uh, oromorph, provided that they can uh, have it entirely. So it depends on the procedures. So some patient might not be able to take orally for some time. So then, you know, oromorph might not be um, a, a viable option. Um, and I think if you're talking about context of ICU, I think if the patient is able to feed entirely, um, you can give it if you need to give it for something else if the patient is, is not um, having other potent, um, you know, like opiate infusion already. Um, so that, that could be given certainly. Um, I suppose morphine given orally or IV have the same side effect profile, except you have more bioavailability when you give IV uh, morphine and hence uh, potential for side effect is more. So there is less sedation with oral morph. Um, hence it could be used with less monitoring, for example, but it all depends on how much dose you use as well. Um, I'd be very careful about using morphine in very small children, as I said. Uh, codeine is pro drug for morphine. Um, it has very variable um, effect depending on the individual, um, shall we say, um, pharmacological profile. Uh, some, some people have uh, ability to convert the drug to morphine and some people don't. Uh, so it, it is unpredictable how, 
how much effect of coding um, you get. Um, so it is slightly falling out of favor. However, it is a reasonable alternative to be used um, if you don't have Oromor. Um, but you have to you know, monitor at least first doses uh, for administration. Um, similar to, to morphine, but less potent uh, is, is a good. Does that answer the question or do you want to ask about anything else? Um, I was just going to ask the, uh, Dr. Ahmed, he's a, he posed that um, uh, question. He can uh, answer in the in the chat if he is, his question has been answered or not. If he, uh, you have you have any other thing uh, to need to be elaborated, please put it in the chat. Thank you, Dalia. Um, I've seen a couple of comments from Dr. Osama Jibali. Uh, he's one of the senior P PIC consultant in Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jibai, to be with us today. And um, he uh, he did mention about um, uh, here about the ketamine is good in bronchial asthma, cause more secretions during bronchoscopy or bronchoscopy, but anticholinergic can control that. Ketamine should be uh, cautiously used in high ICP and glaucoma. Um, Dr. Um, Safa. Al Alim, I think, is one of the uh, PIC consultants in Sudan, if I'm not mistaken, and she did also agree in using ketamine in ICP, and she did um, advice about reading an article, uh, say decreases ICP actually. Um, I think that's all the questions I can see. There is another question from uh, Rawa. Um, what about analgesia and sedation in patient with low GCS? She specifically put three on a ventilator. So, Dr. Ahmed, are you able to answer that question? Uh, sorry, Dr. Rehab, I did not hear the question. Uh, what about analgesia and sedation in patient with low GCS on ventilator? Well, it depends on the reason and the cause of this low GCS. If the patient was having low GCS and he is intubated in the ventilator, you can use benzodiazepine and fentanyl in combination, both of them. If you want to assist the patient's level of consciousness, but you want also on the other hand to keep him sedated, you can do what, what's called a vaca sedation vacation. So you can hold the sedation for a while, uh, evaluate the patient a uh, Glasgow Coma Scale and the Comfort P Scale. And once the patient become more awake, you can resume back the sedation. That's the best way. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Osama Jibali, do you want to add any comment or do you have anything to say to us today? Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum wa Thank you for uh, this presentation. Actually, it, 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 is, it is my pleasure to, to, to know that, mashallah, there's regular workshops going in pediatric critical care uh, in Sudan. Uh, and I came to know uh, just when I'm coming out from the unit today. Anyway, to commence we, during our, our, our experience from six cardiac missions uh, in uh, Wadmadan Cardiac Center, Ahmed Ghassim, and Sudan Cardiac Center at COVID, we noticed that, uh, number one, Sudanese candidates are very trainable. And number one, this is uh, my, not my comment. Comment from Lance Sudanese uh, consultant who shared in the conference workshop in Sudan before. Number two, I noticed that, as all of you mentioned, if you master two or three or four sed uh, medications for sedation, that will be good. For ketamine, Sudan is well known. Chloride is well known. Benzodiazepines are well known. So I think usually in moderate sedation sessions, if the patient is not so sick and it's class one or class two uh, in the uh, American Society of Anesthesia and Health Child, with no high morbidities, I think the vitamin D are very good to control painful procedure. Color hydrate is excellent and very well known in Sudan, as you observed, uh, for non-painful uh, uh, procedure. Sure, other medication can be used. I just want to mention the thing that usually uh, clinical monitor, uh, monitoring the heart rate, pulse oximetry, respiratory rate saturation, during sedation session are very important, are very important. So sedation procedure, it is, it is medication in the... uh, Sorry, Dr. Osama, I think you've mute now. Could you just unmute yourself?
Dr. Sama, you, could you hear me? Yeah. I yes, think, yeah, you're yeah, Yes, I just, uh, I went off for, uh, I don't know why. Just I want to mention sedation sessions means giving sedation medications uh, to control pain and, and, and anxiety uh, to facilitate procedure, but uh, be, be cautious that all sedations need uh, continuous monitoring during the procedure and to be ready in rare cases, which may be compensated by a uh, resuscitation uh, setup. Thank you very much. Thank you for all presenter. Uh, well, I think it is, it is the one hour I attend, it is, it is very beneficial uh, in, 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 in our setup in Sudan. Thank you so much, Dr. Sama. Um, Dr. Safa, do you want to add anything? Or do you have any comment? Dr. Safa, are you still with us? I'm not sure if she's still there or no. So there is another question, Abdullah Tayyib, um, uh, for how long you can use the pre uh in our uh, neuro practice and what's the maximum period did you use it? That's for you, Dr. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. I'm sorry, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, personally, I'm using the Presidex for a few days, not only 24 hours, but uh, what's known as an FDA approved, it's, it's only approved to be used for as infusion in the pediatrics ICU for 24 hours. But personally, I'm using it for, for a few days. Um, I might reach five days using the infusion of Presidex without seeing any complications. I'm just observing the bradycardia, which is the commonest complication or side effect I have ever seen with the Presidex. And they never use the Presidex uh, as boluses. Even when I start the Presidex, I never give boluses to prevent having hypertension. I'm using it only uh, uh, an infusion. And I'm starting usually with the lowest dose and escalate it gradually. Till I, till I achieve the uh, sedation level that I want. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Safa, I will try to unmute you and see if you can talk. I think you want to add something, but is um, your microphone is, you have a problem with your microphone. Um, while waiting for Dr. Safa to comment, uh, I think we've put here, as you see, the Keep Me Safe WhatsApp group. If you can scan the barcode and also we put a link, uh, you can just press on it in the chat to go and through this WhatsApp group, you are gonna see what the update, what's our next um, sessions and how to register and all uh, things updated about PICU and the pediatric emergency if you're interested. Um. Perhaps, sorry, I had to unmute myself because I can't put my hands up. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Sorry, it, it, just going back to the comment about, uh, for Dr. Isra about using phenobarbital and phenytoin for sedating patient who is on CPAP. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about the context of why she has chosen medication, I assume. Probably not readily available, but um, that I just want to talk about other alternative enteral um, uh, medication that can be used to provide some sedation and relaxation. Um, we use them all the time to um, calm children for anxiolytic and sedation for you know, minor procedures or before administration of general anesthesia. So midazolam uh, could be used or any benzodiazepines could be used in you know, like small doses uh, to allow patient uh, to relax. Clonidine, if available orally, is very good medicine uh, in a dose of one to two mics, up to four mics per kilo, um, is good for um, oral sedation, like mild sedation. Dexmedetomidine is a very good agent as well. It could be given intranasally uh, and we use up to four mics and it does provide a very nice um, uh, you know, anxiolytic um, properties and patient could be relaxed. So um, then chlorohydrate, uh, which Amal said is available. I think Amal said dexamethamidine, chlorohydrate are both available and benzodiazepine. So these are all four alternative 
uh, that I probably would use or try to use first in a patient who's having non-invasive ventilation. Because the important thing was, as Dr. Ahmed said, you want to preserve the respiratory drive. You don't want to overstate this patient because uh, if you're delivering non-invasive ventilation um, to a patient with impaired uh, consciousness, so if you move from mild to moderate to deep sedation, then you'll be in trouble. So I hope that will help. Thank you so much, Alia. This is really helpful. Thank you. Um, I can see Dr. Abdullah Tayyip, he's uh, raising his hand. He wants to say comment or questions. Go ahead, Dr. Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ihab. Thank you for a uh, group of keeping me safe. It's very valuable, very important project uh, running now, helping our people in Sudan. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed is my friend, Ahmed bin Mahfouz. Um, we worked together for a long time. Uh, just I have two comment. Uh, the first comment regarding ICU training and uh, what time uh, should be in pediatric training. I think it's unfair to be answered by non pediatrician. Um, ICU is a major branch of pediatric. The, the three major branches, in, uh, four major, sorry, branches of pediatric is uh, neonatology, uh, pediatric intensive care. Pediatric cardiology and pediatric neurology. This is um, the main mandatory uh, pediatric uh, subspecialty training during pediatric training. The others consider to be elective. If you want to take metabolic, it is elective. If you want to take uh, pulmonology, it is elective. But the main major pediatric uh, branch training during the rotation, pediatric, during the pediatric training, is in uh, neonatology, pediatric intensive care pediatric neurology and pediatric uh, cardiology. And uh, there is no pediatric training will be validated without pediatric neurologists or cardiologists or intensivists or neurologists. So in pediatric uh, intensive care, there is in pediatric training, there is two level of training, junior level of training, which is the first two years and senior level of training, which is the second uh, two years. The uh, senior level is the one who's taking responsibility as second on call deciding from home, taking calls from home. The junior level is, is taking call in, in, in house or, or in hospital. This senior, this junior level will take one month per year and or to two months and the senior level will took two months per year of pediatric intensive care. So pediatric intensive care should be at least four to six months during pediatric training rotation. This is a fairest point. The second, because if, if you can't deal with a critical ill patient, then you, you are just pediatrician, which is community pediatric doctor. Uh, then uh, for the other things that of the sedation in Sudan, I have suggestion how to help uh, people there that because here we have, um, which which called sedation course, which is mandatory for anyone practicing, uh, should be taken every year, same like BLS. So I think this, co this course is be being done by uh, anesthesiologists. The anesthesiologist, the anesthesia consultant is the main people who can teach this sedation, medication, and uh, pain management. So this course should be mandatory yearly. Now in Sudan, it can be done as optional. I suggest Dr. Safan, Dr. Ahmad Sadiq as taking leads in pediatric ICU in Sudan to try to, uh, to organize these courses with uh, collaboration and help with the anesthesia uh, on a nearly basis, it will be same like BLS because how we are going to deal with the patient uh, who is sick or is, who is in need for pain management uh, from the care of a doctor who doesn't know the medication, this side effect, and he didn't use it. Unless we put a base line of training which is a short course, usually one day course, which will be same like BLS validated every year, then uh, we cannot guarantee that this doctor who's safe to decide about what medication, what side effect to be, uh, uh, this patient should receive. So I suggest Dr. Mohammed Sadiq, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Asafa, to try to initiate this project with the anesthesia in Sudan, one day course to be optional for pediatrician and then it, uh, by time it, it it can be uh, done as, as obligatory. Thank you, Rehab. Thank you, the Keep Me Safe group.
and uh, keep on keep on uh, doing these great jobs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Abdullah, about uh, your comment. That's really crucial. Uh, so what we are doing now, when we started doing the keep me safe course, we put the pain in one of the requirements. And to be honest, when we sat with the local faculty back in Sudan, uh, they did mention about they have a problems with the pain and sedation, and that's why we put this in the course. We put it as a separate workshop to talk about it, and we can offer all the help and support for the people. This is a very nice project. What you talk about. And we'll put it in our consideration and we'll see how we're gonna take it from there. Thank you so much. Dr. Safa, do you want to add anything? Um, I can't see just- Hello? Your... Hello, hi, hi, Dr. Safa. Hi, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Rehab, how are you? How Dr. Ahmed al Mahfouz, uh, Dr. Usama Jibali, Abdullah, all my colleagues, junior and senior, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your commitment to your colleagues here in Sudan. Uh, mashallah and Rabbani Dikum al wal Afia. Uh, just so commenting what uh, Dr. Abdullah said, uh, inshallah, I will uh, and uh, help in getting all our anesthetic um, colleagues to help in the future. Uh, we're lucky in Muhammad Amin Hamid, we have a clinical pharmacologist, so I don't say that we have no problem with sedation, but no. Uh, considering the side effects and uh, what we should use, um, they, they, they're very, very, very helpful. Um, we had a course with the Pediatric Fundamental Critical Care Support, and sadly that has uh, been uh, hindered uh, due to political situation. So I remember there were some very, very rich uh, lectures on uh, use of sedation, and we had our anesthetic uh, colleagues uh, helping us during that time. Lakin inshallah, Dr. Abdullah, I promise you uh, in the future and our junior colleagues that they might, they, they'll have uh, better help. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Al-Mahfouz, uh, thank you for a very, 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 very rich lecture. And uh, it helps us. And uh, the next time we can have one where what to use in our re low resource income settings. Amal gave a very, 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 uh, very, um, I can't say, uh, it's the truth, basically. Uh, it's sad, but it's it is true. She highlighted on 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 many of the aspects, uh, the things that we face daily, uh, the training uh, or the lack of training, political situation, the financial. Sometimes uh, you're faced at there and then. Uh, the patient I mentioned uh, that we used uh, mid um, ketamine for increased intracranial pressure, suddenly we ran out of midazolam and fentanyl. So I was faced with, what, where do I go from here? So in the corner, there I was Googling and ketamine. Ketamine is available, but then it's contraindicated. But now there's, a, there's um, an article that says that it decreases the increased intracranial pressure. So I had to go for it. And assist, he said, are you sure? I said to him, well, He's my patient. I can't do anything else. So alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, we had a good uh, outcome for that patient. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I thank everybody. And uh, may Allah continue uh, to bless us with all our colleagues uh, outside Sudan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Safa. And uh, as I said that, um, join us and sharing your, your projects and what you thought. And we are more than helpful um, welcome to, to have you in uh, um, having your suggestions and what, what you want from us to do. We are okay. here to support children in Sudan. So for, feel free to contact me or Arwa. Uh, this is my colleague. She's the, the, um, the project founder and I'm the co-founder. Just to drop a message in, in the in WhatsApp group and we'll be ready to answer your questions and offer the help we can do. Inshallah. Barakallah fikum jami'an. Thank you so much. Um, so sorry, we've been like 80 minutes uh, behind the time. But if we, uh, as I said, that you have any questions, you have any query, just drop a message in the WhatsApp group. I'm more than happy to um, to help you and answer your questions. Thank you so much for the attendance today. And thanks for the speakers, all of them. You've been brilliant and you quickly respond to our request that please help us in this um, session and uh, you did really well. Thank you so much and feel free to go if you want to go. Uh, I just want the speaker to be with, uh, with us um, for just five minutes and the other people, they are free to go.
Assalamu alaikum again. Uh, thank you so much, Lynn Speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Minate. Um, that we, we are so happy to have you today. Your talk is really essential. And as I said earlier, that we've got a lot of junior nurses back in Sudan. They're really junior. They've just graduated one year from um, uh, nursing school and they need a lot of help. Uh, I just want to ask you if you're able, are you happy to, um, to participate with us in the future? I'm just going to take your number from Dr. Baha and um, uh, text you and um, ask you kindly to help us uh, in training the nursing staff, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. I have no problem. I am willing to help. Um, this is a very nice group and very inspiring. I was inspired on how you work hard to help your um, Sudan um, health professionals. So I'm glad to participate in Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and um, hope to see you later. Um, Dr. Ahmed, Mashkur Jidden Jidden very nice talk, Saraha. Shukran Jidden, and Hna Denak, very short notice period to, to, to prepare and present. And I think Min Hiba Inak, you are so excited about the project and you want to support us in the future. Um, uh, even Minate, if you have any comments um, about the session, any suggestion for us, just tell us if um, this is an opportunity to tell us what we need to do. Yeah, these things we are not seeing get frequently these days. طبعا انا دكتور عبد الله الطيب از كلوز فريندز اوف ماين يعني فلما شفت انا عبد الله ضحكت لما شفت عبد الله يو هاف تو يعني صراحه يو هاف تو انفايت هيم وانس انه از از ا فيري سمارت جاي اند فيري انفورماتيف جاي حتستفيد وشفت الدكتور محمد صديق برضه موجود از فريندز اوف ماين فانا بالنسبه لي اشوف انه الانيشيتيف هذه از فيري انفورماتيف فيري هيلبفول بمشيئه الله حتسوي نقله نوعيه وبالعكس احنا حاضرين في اي شيء تحتاجه شكراً شكراً كثير شكراً كثير 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 But we need to, um, all of us, we just share our experience and uh, what's updated in the pediatric intensive care and, and emergency. And definitely we're going to send for you an invitation um, near to us. And we are happy to have you again, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you so much. Inshallah. Uh, Don't forget, Dr. Allah. Dalia, do you want to add anything? Thank you for coming Thanks, Ahmed. And... Um, Minute um, and Ahmed, uh, it's been nice. I think the there was no coordination, but the talks happened to be complementary. I think uh, we touched base on different things and the same things from different angles. So I'm happy to be part of uh, the group, and I think I might have upset some of your colleagues <laughs> <laughs> by commenting on the rotation duration. I think. It was merely because the Sudan rotation is short. Um, uh, so, and there isn't any ICU as such, you know, so I'm not sure of the value of having choices. It's not, this is not a hypothetical discussion. This is just in context of Sudan. So yeah, ICU is good, but for, for seven years training in the UK, the candidate only get three to six months maximum, isn't it? So it kind of makes sense. Um, yeah. And it, 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 from patient perspective and continuity of service is probably not a very good thing. But anyway, it's a different view, and it's not, and it's not the sort of a platform to say it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> don't, this, is a, this is the main problem. I think Dalia, they are just. I, I think what I've got from them, they are really um, the main issue in Sudan: lack of senior support and backup. And whenever you face yourself that you need to face A to Z and very tough situation in Sudan, you are going to be panicked. And you think that, yes, I need more time to spend in a PIC and tr tr treating a critical health patient. I think that's why, but it's still, uh, you know, things in Sudan, they, we don't have like a pediatric intensive care training. And uh, still we are working with other people over there, just try to um, facilitate this and make it 
easy for people to apply for training and get more experience. But you know, I think in Sudan, it's just need a bit of time and support from the other people. But um, I don't think there's a problem. What well, you said, this is the truth. Even here in UK, the maximum, if you are lucky, because you can spend the seven months without being in ICU, but uh, you know that other people, you, you are surrounded with a senior, they support you, an aesthetic team, they are supporting a critical old patient, all the people that work in like a team. So hopefully we'll see this someday in Sudan. Yeah, and, and thanks I have for organizing this. This is very organized. And I think for once there was no any uh, multi like media issue or any, uh, you know, hiccups. So it went very smooth. <laughs> this is Mohammed yeah. behind the scene. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's been very good, I think, and well attended. So yeah, very successful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you want to add it? Sorry. And pleasure to meet all the colleagues virtually. Hope to work with you again in the future. Thank you so much. Amal, do you want to add anything? Uh, uh, sure, Rehab. Sure, uh, firstly, I want to thank uh, both Dr. Ahmed and Manet. Uh, actually, thank you very much for joining this system. Uh, Keep Me Safe project actually is a very smart project and, and Rehab, she knows that in the next period, I'll be outside Sudan. Dr. Ahmed, I'll be joining Saudi Arabia in King Fahad Medical City recently. But I'm going to continue with them for sure. Uh, so uh, it's very um, it's very important to talk about uh, what you said, Dalia. Actually, I don't have any but believe me, I, I did a four years uh, work in Sudan in PICU. I faced registrars that come in in PICU for two months. Here, of course, the system is lagging behind. As you say, Rehab, there is just only two pets, and maybe it's filled by just one patient. There is no senior, there is no well-established system. So you find the registrar is very terrified. Actually, when the two months is end, yeah, no. <laughs> the registrar is just seeing that uh, some uh, things come clear. Like in, you make sure that he, he, he's not, that period is not enough for him, for the patient and for the BIC setting. We lose some registrar very early before they are uh, yani, educated anything. And so they, they go and come other registrars which do not know anything about the ICU. It may be a problem because we based in ICU or registrar only. So uh, this this may, may, may yani, we don't have the uh, personnel and experienced personnel uh, starting from medical staff to specialist and consultant. So I guess uh, two months is a little period. But can, let's That's why that. we're here. Well, that's why we're here. We support the people uh, trying yes. to do frequent sessions and uh, workshops just to make the people life easy. Being yes. in intensive care, this is very stressful even here. And anywhere, anywhere in the world, but that's why we're here. Thank you so much yes. for your. Um, Thank comment. you. Uh, I'm so I'm sorry nice for uh, delay, 20 minutes behind. Uh, so, so sorry for Manit and Dalia and Ahmed. Feel free, you can go now. Thank you so much, and we are so happy to have you today. Thank you so much. Bye. Also, it was nice meeting you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you all. Goodbye. Okay, bye, bye. Osama, Ash, Minshafak.